formed since 1995 with a variety of non-governmental organizations and the United Nations. Uh, most of my work is focused in Washington, D.C., and I've looked at um, U.S. arms trade policy, but I've studied the impact and the trade of small arms around the world. I've also written numerous articles, done many speaking uh, presentations, and written two books on the international arms trade. So today what I want to do is focus on the issue of small, illicit small arms trafficking and talk about how these weapons really have become uh, weapons of individual destruction. Let's start out with an example. At 9 p.m. on November 26, 2008, gunmen began a series of coordinated attacks in the city of Mumbai, India. Um, it terrorized the city, it captivated the world, and using only small arms and, and, and grenades, roughly two dozen operatives from the uh, Kashmir-based militant group called Lakshar e Taida um, attacked Mumbai, which paralyzed the financial and cultural center of India for 62 hours. In total, when all the damage was done, the gunmen had struck 10 locations with coordinated mili military pre precision, armed solely with low-tech small arms and light weapons, killing nearly 200 people and injuring 350. Unfortunately, the devastating impact of, of the attacks in Mumbai is all too common around the world. Small arms and light weapons are a class of weapons that are responsible for hundreds of thousands of deaths and immeasurable human suffering every year. In the interstate conflicts of the post-Cold War world, we see that the majority of fighting is done solely with small arms. Now, this classification of weapons includes military uh, weapons and commercial firearms that can be operated either by an individual or a small crew and range from everything from a revolver to something as sophisticated as a Stinger missile. Now these weapons have dramatically changed uh, the landscape of modern conflict in daily life around the world. An estimated 875 million small arms and light weapons are in circulation around the world. Approximately 650 million of these are actually in civilian hands. Each year, another 8 million weapons and 10 to 14 billion rounds of ammunition are manufactured. If you look at the total, that's one weapon um, to arm one in every eight people in the world and enough ammunition to shoot everyone in the world twice. It's a lot of weapons. These weapons are used both by governments and by non-state groups fighting in conflicts around the world, where hundreds of thousands of people are killed and injured every year. But small arms and light weapons are also responsible for about 200,000 non-conflict deaths every year. These are things that range from murders to suicides, and these weapons and, and have had destructive impacts on people and countries that are ostensibly at peace. For example, more people have been killed by guns in Brazil during the last 10 years than in any other country in the world, including those that are at war. Small arms have a variety of impacts on society, no matter where or how they're used. Um, some of these impacts are direct and they can be measured in numbers, like deaths and injuries, incidences of psychosocial trauma. Um, they can be used to perpetuate human rights violations, contribute to massive refugee and internally displaced people populations as people flee the violence and instability that is often um, seen after these weapons um, have entered into a society. Uh, the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center counts 28 countries where armed conflicts have caused displacement of over 25 million people, at least 70% of which are women and children. And as I said, many of these women and children um, are fleeing small arms violence. Small arms also impact societies more indirectly. They diminish support structures and opportunities for citizens. These resulting circumstances, such as limited access to public goods and humanitarian assistance, prevention of children attending school, limiting health care, denial of economic growth and opportunities, all negatively in impact um, vulnerable populations. A World Bank study found that a civil war costs the country approximately 60% of its annual GDP. So what does that mean in real terms? If you look at what that means for, say, Africa, which has seen many conflicts in the past decade. A 2007 Oxfam study found that between 1990 and 2005, the 23 countries in Africa that experienced conflict saw their economy shrink about 15% a year at a cost of almost $18 billion annually. 
That may not sound like a lot, but that cost African countries such as Sudan, Congo, Rwanda, $284 billion in total during those 14, or excuse me, 15 years, which for those countries is a tremendous amount. In countries at peace, then, small arms violence can also limit growth. Um, the Inter-American Development Bank estimates that violence costs Latin American countries approximately 14% of their annual regional GDP. Now, be beyond these detrimental impacts of small arms during conflict, small arms also impact what I call consequential impacts on societies, and particularly on children. Uh, years of conflict can create um, or contribute to a culture of violence where weapons are viewed as symbols of power, of dominance, of worth, and to those that are using this culture of violence as their frame of reference, weapons become tools for conflict resolution and undermine the moral legitimacy of parents and community leaders, all of which makes it difficult for children to learn how to seek peaceful opportunities and solutions. And such circumstances often result in a culture of impunity, as individuals and groups are not held accountable for their socially disruptive actions. If you take it even a step further, a deadly combination between the proliferation of small arms and the extended length of many conflicts um, has made the using of, of child combatants possible and attractive, though it's worth noting that children are also used as soldiers in areas where small arms are in short supply. Children are being used in conflicts in at least, or are being used in countries, um, about 17 conflicts around the world. Um, governments are also responsible uh, for use of children in their own militaries or in government supported armed groups in eight of these countries. So this is not just an issue of non-state actors using um, child soldiers. Not all child soldiers are direct combatants and, and wield some of these small arms and light weapons. Um, others are used in more support roles, such as, as messengers or spies or porters or cooks. And it's worth noting that both boys and girls um, serve as si child soldiers, and both genders often suffer forced drug use and sexual abuse. And, and girls, of course, are going to face additional hardships as they may serve as sex slaves as, at the same time as they're serving as active combatants. So with all of these devastating impacts of small arms on society, um, they are the choice, a weapon of choice for today's conflicts. But why? Why are they so popular? Now there's about eight reasons why small arms are attractive tools of violence. First, they're low in cost. In some conflict areas, you can exchange an AK-47 for livestock, for gemstones, or even just a few dollars. Even sophisticated light weapons are financially accessible to terrorists, criminals, and insurgents. Um, for example, a first-generation Russian manned portable air defense system costs as little as a few thousand dollars on the black market. Second, they're widely available. As I mentioned at the outset, there's an estimated 875 million small arms currently in circulation around the world, so supply is really never a problem. Third, they're extremely lethal. In some conflicts, up to 80% of casualties can be blamed on small arms and light weapons. They're also easily portable. They can be carried on backs and cars, on animals, across unprotected international borders, easily from one conflict to another. As they're moving across borders, they can be easily concealed. Multiple pistols can be hidden in your clothing at border checkpoints. Um, small arms have been disguised in packages of humanitarian and food aid. They're also extremely simple to use. Um, as I mentioned, a child as young as eight can easily fire assault rifles and little training is required to become an expert in the use of these weapons. These weapons are very durable and they last a very long time. In Southeast Asia, weapons left over from the Vietnam War are still in use. And in Iraq, we're seeing today that World War II era weapons are still used. But even when further war is avoided, small arms can become an instrument for the develop disruption of, the, of development assistance, interference with efforts to deliver food or medicine and supplies to people that are in dire need of relief. Refugees are often afraid to return home because of the large numbers of weapons still in the hands of fighters that haven't been demobilized or who that, that have secret weapons caches in, in their former areas of conflict. And lastly, these weapons are legal. These weapons have legitimate military, police, and civilian uses, which means unlike many other classes of weapons like nuclear weapons or chemical or biological weapons or even things like landmines, they can't be entirely banned and therefore control of them becomes exceedingly difficult. Now like any market good, the availability and cost of small arms is driven by supply and demand. 
And these market forces are becoming more globalized in this more globalized world. Now, while nowhere near the dollar value of the heavy conventional arms trade, you know, things like fighter jets and warships, the small arms trade is still big business and very profitable. There are over 1,200 companies in over 90 countries that produce brand new weapons every year. The legal small arms market is estimated at about $4 billion a year globally, and the illegal small arms trade could be anywhere between $1 and $2 billion. The illicit arms trade is what I want to focus on now. This trade fuels conflict and destruction. When legal avenues for acquiring small arms are unavailable, interested parties can turn to a thriving black market to meet their needs. And I just want to point out that there's a very, very fine line between what makes a sale legal and illegal. There's actually no international law that specifically regulates small arms transfers. So you could say then that a legal small arms transfer conforms to existing international laws, things like arms embargoes or international human rights or humanitarian law, and the national laws of those involved countries um, that are involved in the trade. So clearly then you can, by default, say, well, an illegal sale violates those laws. However, it's not quite that simple. There are many, many shades of gray when you're talking about arms sales. There are ambiguities in laws, there are loopholes in legislation, which may make it difficult to categorize a sale as purely illegal or purely illicit. Um, some sales may be legal under the national laws, but may violate some international controls. As I said, legal sales are conducted in accordance with UN arms embargoes. They follow national regulation and practice. Illicit deals are often made without government consent or control, but they may involve corrupt government officials that act on their own for personal gain um, in clear violation of international and national laws. These are the kinds of sales that we see often to criminal organizations or, or um, unscrupulous individuals. Um, these kinds of sales allow questionable recipients, such as abusive governments, rebel groups, criminal organizations, to buy and sell weapons very easily on the illicit market. Nearly all small arms started their life cycle as legally produced weapons. The one exception that I do want to point out is what's called craft production. Um, craft production is crude, small-scale, handmade production of weapons that yields a supply of completely unregulated weapons that can be traded freely on the black market. Now, although on the whole, craft production is just a tiny, tiny fraction of global small arms production, the practice can actually have large local and regional impact. So, for example, craft production in Chile has been found to fuel the activities of criminals and gangs and contribute to violence in that country. Now, at any point along the supply chain, weapons can be diverted from the legal to the illicit market. And while certainly, as I mentioned, kind of the weak national, regional, and international policies and laws may allow weapons to enter the black market, there are also six specific ways in which weapons are diverted that I want to point out. First, government officials may facilitate the diversion of small arms by bending or breaking national laws or issuing false export documents often in exchange for bribes or other kinds of personal gain. UN sanctions panels on the countries of Angola and Liberia found numerous examples of governmental flouting of arms embargoes by either supplying states or governments that allowed weapons to be shipped through their countries and get to Angola, Angola and Liberia. Second, government stockpiles are vulnerable to looting during periods of domestic instability. In Albania in 1997, national arsenals were stormed by mobs that were angered by a failed governmental pyramid scheme. More than half a million Albanian weapons flowed into the Balkans and beyond, contributing to violence in an already very tense region. Third, insecure or poorly managed stocks of both private and government sector firearms are vulnerable to theft and loss, most often which end up in the hands of unscrupulous arms dealers, crime syndicates, terrorists, or rebel groups. For example, the South African police and the South African Defense Force alone lose an estimated 8,500 weapons every year. Fourth, soldiers who are not receiving regular or enough pay may sell their own weapons or weapons they pilfered from government stocks for much, much needed cash. So at the end of the Cold War, thousands of Russian soldiers sold their personal weapons um, and Israeli officers have been known to sell weapons to Palestinian militants despite the fact that these weapons could likely be used against them or their colleagues. 
Fifth, civilian-owned weapons are attractive targets uh, for theft. As I mentioned at the beginning, nearly 75% of the world's firearms are in civilian hands, and an estimated 1 million firearms are stolen from private owners worldwide every year. These estimates only reflect reported theft, so the total is actually um, likely to be much higher. Sixth, the diversion of small arms to the black market is facilitated by weak national laws that govern sale, purchase, and ownership. So when domestic possession and purchase isn't adequately regulated, individuals can purchase dozens of weapons at one time and then resell them, often illegally, to those that are either not eligible to purchase them or, in fact, to countries that have more restrictive laws. And this is what's called straw purchasing. Um, the United States, for example, has much less restrictive gun purchasing laws than Mexico or Canada. And so U.S. weapons actually account for approximately 50% of illegal handguns in Canada and 80% of arms that are recovered from crimes in Mexico. Now, once weapons leave the legal market, they're very difficult to trace and they can quickly spread anywhere. And small arms have actually become not only a sought-after commodity, but also the currency that's accepted for other commodities. They're linked to the global trafficking of other illicit goods, such as diamonds, narcotics, and these interconnected networks are used by criminals, militants, and terrorists to fund their activities. So I think I want to just spend a moment talking about terrorism, because I think the use of, of um, small arms by terrorists is one of the most um, common uh, issues um, that we're facing when we're talking about how do you address terrorist threats. Um, we focus much of the world's um, attention on the use of um, biological or nuclear devices in the hands of terrorists. But in fact, terrorists are already using these weapons, or using small arms and light weapons as weapons of mass destruction. If you look at 175 terrorist acts that were documented in the U.S. State Department's 2003 report on global terrorism, approximately half were committed with small arms and light weapons alone, not using any other kinds of weapons. So I mentioned Mumbai in the opening, but this is really nothing new and is quite common when you look at large-scale terrorist attacks. Um, the October 2002 um, occupation of the Moscow Palace of Culture Theater by Chechen militants was done primarily with weapons, or excuse me, with guns, Kalashnikovs, um, and explosives. Um, in this particular instance, the militants held 750 hostages in a three-day siege. A month later, a continent away, two um, SA-7 Grail shoulder-fired surface-to-air missiles were fired at an Israeli Airlines Boeing 757 as it took off from Mombasa Airport in Kenya. Now, this failed attempt was believed to be the work of al-Qaeda-linked terrorists. Um, but you don't need massive um, and sophisticated terrorist groups um, to use small arms and light weapons effectively. Um, in September 2005, for example, a father and son hijacked a plane in Colombia using two grenades that they had managed to smuggle past airport security. They weren't associated with a major terrorist group. They were simply protesting against the government. Now, terrorists also use the same means as other groups um, to acquire weapons on the black market. They use theft, uh, excuse me, theft, craft production. They utilize existing legal channels and exploit loopholes in national arms laws. If you look at, uh, there was a manual called How I Can Train Myself for Jihad that was discovered at an Islamic terrorist training center in Kabul. And it actually highlighted the easy availability of guns in the United States as a key source for weapons that could be used in terrorist activities. And in fact, it called on members of al-Qaeda living in the United States to obtain as many weapons as they could, preferably AK-47s, from gun shows and gun shops, and then send those to sympathizers around the world. Terrorists also use the thriving illicit market in small arms that's provided by unscrupulous arms brokers. Now, during the Cold War, we had arms brokers that worked to arm the proxy allies, excuse me, proxy allies of the governments they were aligned with. Um, but since the end of the Cold War, kind of, there's no ideological basis for arms brokers' work. They'll sell to anyone who will, is willing to pay. Arms brokers use very impressive networks in, able, in order to move their weapons um, along the edge of, of legal transfers. They build up trans clandestine transport practices. They develop strong relationships with corrupt officials. Um, they use fake documents, front companies, 
and they often allow uh, work with governments in third party countries um, to transport their their weapons um, through for share the profits or kickbacks. Arms brokers also uh, disguise their weapons um, in more um, harmless looking items. So they may um, say that this is humanitarian aid or their farming equipment. Um, in fact, one um, arms shipment intended for Colombian guerrillas was carried ac across Costa Rica hidden in shipments of vegetables. Now, some arms brokers are completely unknown to the public um, and to law enforcement agencies, and others conduct their business in full view of, of government officials and, and law enforcement agents. Um, a very good example is, is an arms dealer named Victor Boot, who lived freely and openly in Moscow for years. Um, he gave interviews to the New York Times. He contributed to the 2005 Nicolas Cage movie, Lord of War. He was frequently seen dining at his favorite sushi restaurant. In March 2008, he was arrested in Thailand on, on charges of supplying arms to the Colombian rebel group FARC. And he's now in Thailand awaiting extradition to the United States. However, the arrest of, of someone like Boot is the exception. Um, they often act with impunity. Um, there aren't national laws or international standards that regulate their activities. And there's often little cooperation to prosecute them, primarily because legal governments or government agencies need these brokers to, to do some work for them. Um, U.S. officials in the U.K. have, have um, actually admitted that they've used Victor Boot and his front companies um, unintentionally um, in order to get uh, cargo and materials into Iraq immediately after the U.S. invasion in 2003. Um, so there's a, there's a quid pro quo relationship there. So clearly the reality is that, that curbing small arms proliferation and misuse remains a very, very difficult issue. And there's no quick fix, fast acting solutions. Um, real progress on minimizing the effects of small arms proliferation takes a long time. It requires creativity and it requires a lot of different actors that are willing to work together. So it's not just a job for national governments, though they have to do their share, but it's also important that local communities, regional organizations, and the international community as a whole comes together to solve this problem. Now because it's so varied and has so many different um, layers, there are several approaches to controlling small arms proliferation and misuse that need to be undertaken concurrently. You have to have national, regional, and global actions um, that are developed and implemented simultaneously. And what I like to do is group these policies and practices that address small arms proliferation into um, four categories. Controlling supply, taking weapons out of circulation, ending misuse, and curbing demand. And these are very, very simple in the sense that um, they, the definitions do exactly what those, those titles say. Um, when you control supply, you make sure that you have firm controls on the export of these weapons, um, that you have ways to trace um, the weapons and where they're going, and make sure that the end user who you w export that weapon to is actually who's using that weapon down the road. Um, there's actually an international treaty being discussed at the United Nations right now called the Arms Trade Treaty, which would establish some international standards for the export of weapons. Taking weapons out of circulation, quite obvious. It means um, make sure that not only we're controlling new supply um, of weapons, but we're ensuring that weapons that are already in circulation are very tightly controlled, that they remain um, safely stored and secured and managed. Um, that we make sure that when we disarm combatants at the end of a conflict that they turn in their weapons and those weapons are either destroyed or they're put in a place for safekeeping. We also have to end misuse. We need to make sure that people aren't using weapons which are legal for purposes that they're not intended, whether that's law enforcement or civilians or the military. And lastly, it sounds a little more difficult, but things, how do you curb demand? How do you make countries, individuals, groups not want weapons to solve their problems. This has to look at the complexities of violence and, and the realities of why a conflict is existing in a particular country. I, I don't want to make, to end on, on, a, uh, on a down note that these, this is a very complicated um, issue. I do think it's complex, uh, but it's not impossible. It just requires um, all of us, whether you're a policymaker or an individual, to think outside the box. 
this is a multifaceted issue with multi-layered solutions and I think it actually lends itself to being more exciting um, and allowing us to come up with programs and policies that are that can be undertaken all over the world um, and that provide unique perspectives in curbing the international small arms threat. Thank you very much.